Good evening to all and uh, thank you for my predecessors for giving me the hall and so that we move on to the last session for this uh, today uh, that's spot pori so here we are going to discuss about the several aspects in the field of ophthalmology and uh, i take the honor to welcome my chairperson dr santan gopal sir co-chairperson professor kirti singh she would be joining us soon Convener Dr. Bibhuti Bhushan sir, co-convener Dr. Thomas Cherian sir, and myself would be there as a moderator for you, Dr. Shweta Tripathi. So just changing our order in uh, a way, uh, since Dr. Sharad Babu sir has to catch the flight, we'll start with his presentation. Um, that's Community Ophthalmology Avoidable Blindness and our role. Sir. And yeah. I would request the speakers to stick on to time so that finish in time, yeah. though we are running late, sir. Yeah, good evening, uh, dear friends. Uh, this is about uh, what is our role in uh, avoidable blindness in our country. So uh, as a private practitioner, I started in a two-room uh, <laughs> clinic and then one OT and one OPD with a 20-chair uh, uh, OPD hall. And then uh, I started my clinic and then I, we have grown big now with three hospitals, uh, three tertiary centers and some eight vision centers and uh, a very big outreach program also. So how we started and all that, I'll just, I'll just uh, uh, express myself how I could do all this. And then what is our role in preventing this avoidable blindness? So the major causes of blindness, as you know, it's a cataract, 66.2%. And then uh, when you see uh, the cataract surgery complications because of cataract surgery are 7.2%. So this is what the scenario in the management of cataract surgery in India. So uh, the uh, visual impairment and how it has been brought down from 5.3% to 2.5% in the last few years, but as the population is increasing, the numbers as such have been increasing uh, from the past few years. And the presenting vision in better eye, when you see that the cataract, uh, they are more, that is almost 62.8%. And then uh, the other uh, reasons are the myopia and of course the child myopia recently after the COVID. And then what are the reasons? There are no money for them to get the surgery done and uh, no time and then no escort for them, uh, the people to bring them to the main hospital. So uh, how do we do that? So there are some few things which I thought uh, 25 years back and then I started my practice. So as a social responsibility, as a human being, I thought we need to do something to the community apart from the people coming to my private clinic. So the, it started as doing some eye camps uh, in and around the, in villages where uh, the neglected people are there from the family or even they are not uh, uh, rich enough to get a surgery, cataract surgery done. Um, in uh, our state, the Telangana, the state government has done a very big project, the Kanti Vilgu, wherein they have done a screening for 15 uh, uh, million people uh, were tested and 4 million uh, glasses were given. And of course, they started with the cataract surgeries, but there, is, there was an incidence of endophthalmitis and they, they stopped uh, the surgical and then they started only giving glasses. And of course, there are a lot of people got benefited last three years back. And then again, this program started now and from June, from January 18th, we are starting again the program in our state. So I started with doing uh, here and there camps and then uh, selecting the poor people, bringing them here. That was my first clinic in 93-2000. After that, this is the second one and this is the new one which uh, we moved into. And uh, we got uh, associated with the Operation I said Universal and uh, that NGO, they started uh, uh, giving us the insight how to do go to the camps, how to do this uh, in a bigger way. So the, we started a concept called the Vision Center concept and the hospital-based community uh, eye health checkup camps. So two concepts we started. One is the Vision Center where we started Vision Centers where there is a, a need for the uh, eye testing where the patients have to travel for more, more than 80 to 100 kilometers to the uh, city to get an eye examination. Those areas we selected and then we started uh, these vision centers with the optometrist. And so what do we have there? We do a Maya, the eye checkup, grass eye checkup, and the retinal diseases are being diagnosed with the fundus camera. Then with the uh, help of teleophthalmology, the photographs are sent to the main hospital. Apart from that, 
we have a set of these community health workers who work in that area of the villages in and around who selected for that vision centers and then uh, they treat not only that but they do the health education eye education and also apart from that the immunization program and all we train them and then they are being trained by the operation i said universal and that's what we do and uh, we have the patients coming in directly to the vision center and then these community health workers go to the villages go <coughs> Yeah, have a eye checkup house to house and then they pull them up to for eye camp and then the the eye camp group go there with the optometrist with the counselor go there uh, have a selection and then do that uh, screening program and whoever is necessary the basic glasses are being given there and from there they are being driven to the uh, vision center and from there they are being picked up if there is any surgical intervention needed and these are the 15 villages we have been declared uh, avoidably blindness free villages and eight villages are on the uh, pipeline. And then, uh, uh, so this is how we do, like uh, we select them to go around and then on and on, there will be three sets of uh, screening. One is the optometrist, health worker, then the optometrist, then the doctor. And finally, the Vision 2020, they declare that as a uh, blind-free village. And then, uh, so what is the next like? When you're coming back to the 7.2% of the blindness happening, so we thought, why can't we train the young ophthalmologists who are coming down, who are passing out of the, uh, uh, the medical program? So what is it happening for these uh, uh, postcards who are coming in, the new postcards who are coming in? What, uh, what is happening is uh, not more than 50 or uh, 100 surgeries they are doing in uh, some of the hospitals, and they don't have any experience of how to go ahead and then uh, do the basic cataract surgery with an eye oil implantation. So we thought like, uh, why can't we train these post cadets who are coming in? So first we are hospital is ready to do the DNB program, but we thought not we don't want to do the DNB program, but we'll take the postdoctoral fellows and then train them in surgical skills. So that's how we started with the one month program. And even the Mindpal Academy of Health Education from uh, the Mahed, they used to send the post cadets to our place to Varangal all the way for a one month program, training program in SACS. But from there, uh, we had an idea, then, then we procured a, a, a training, a, a certified training by the health university from our state, and our hospital is the only hospital to have that program, wherein we have six uh, postdoctoral fellows who are getting trained in our hospital for a one-year program. And apart from that, we have a short-term program, one or two months programs also happening in our hospital to train the consultants who are coming there and spending one or two months and then learning the latest techniques of FACO and uh, uh, secondary eye oil implantations. So if you can please Because we are in the American so Academy of Ophthalmology, even the uh, people from abroad also are coming and doing this uh, training program. And uh, because of this, I've been getting a lot of uh, uh, appreciations all over the world. And uh, before I conclude, I request you all to join the Family Benefit Scheme of All, all India Ophthalmic Society. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Indeed, it was an enlightening talk and a very much time-needed talk, especially for the young ophthalmologists to share their contribution towards the avoidable blindness in India. Uh, can I request the panel to give their opinion just a bottom line? Well, uh, it was really a uh, very enlightening talk. And uh, I think this is the need of the hour in a country like uh, India that we all should follow uh, uh, this kind of a program so that the health reaches to the poorest and uh, to the people where they can't afford, they can't afford to come to the hospital, to come to the doctor. So we need to uh, go to them to help them. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, sir. It is a very noble work you are doing. And uh, with that, I call upon the uh, first speaker, again, the second speaker I can say for the day. That's uh, Dr. Simar Rajan Singh. Yeah, so he is going to deliver his talk upon surgical management of retinopathy of prematurity. Uh, good evening, everybody, and thanks to AOS once again for this opportunity. Uh, so I'll be talking about the surgical management of ROP. Uh, so for surgical management of ROP, I think we owe a lot to this man, Dr. Michael Tracy, whom we lost just last year, October. 
who revolutionized the field of surgery in young infants and especially for ROP. So a lot that I'll be talking about was first described by him. So as far as the uh, surgery for ROP goes, it is primarily reserved for the advanced stages of ROP, stage four and stage five. The, all the other stages of ROP can primarily be managed with observation or laser alone. So stage 4A, 4B, 5A and 5B are the uh, set criteria for surgery, whereas for 5C and A ROP, the surgery has questionable indications. Some may do it, some won't do it. So what we have to understand is that infants are not smaller adults. The eyes are not just smaller, they are different anatomically. So yes, the eyeball is shorter. It is an average of 16 millimeters at the time that we are going to enter these eyes. But they have a very thick crystalline lens. So the lens occupies a lot more space in the vitreous cavity than I want it, it would normally do in an adult. So we have our entry space is very limited in these. Another thing that limits our entry space is that the pars plana is not developed. So we are entering from the pars plicata. So uh, we are further moving closer to the lens and higher chances of lens touch are there. And then there is a lifted retina while we are entering. So there is an always chance of hitting the lens, uh, lifted retina when we are entering. And there is poor scleral rigidity, so the need for sutures may be a little more than what we would do in adults. The, so the, given the shorter axial length, there is need for special instrumentation or special techniques for these ROPIs. Unfortunately, all the instrumentation, majority of what we use is made for adult eyes. We have this set of short instruments, trocar cannulas from DORC, and an instrument set from Alcon as well, but they are not readily available. And the Alcon set does not come with trocars uh, with the cannula, so you just have to go transcleral and suture all these cases. So what we described is a technique to uh, avoid all this and a simple modification in our technique of the stop and slide. Let's just go directly to the patient video and show you. So you see how lifted the retina is just right behind the crystalline lens. You can see it there uh, with the naked eye. And so this is about 1 to 1.5 millimeter from the limbus where we enter in these eyes. So once you are going in, there is a point when you get a giveaway of the sclera. So that is the point where you just stop and then you just slide the, uh, the cannula over the trocar and do not insert the trocar completely. I'll just show it in one more, uh, uh, one more port. So here you are going in. So just as you feel the giveaway, so you reduce the effective length of the trocar going in from about eight, eight millimeters to about four millimeters. And then here you slide it over. So this reduces the chances of retinal injury directly when you are entering the eye. For surgery in ROP, the most important thing to understand is the tractional forces in ROP because vitrectomy is not like a conventional vitrectomy where you are going to remove the entire hyaloid. You just have to identify these tractional forces, bisect them and come out. So the first is the tractional force from the ridge to the optic disc. Then is between the ridge to ridge, from the ridge to the crystalline lens and from the ridge to the periphery. So if you can identify these tractional forces and dissect them, your work is done in ROP surgery. So here you can see an infant who presented late to us at about eight weeks old. There is a direct tractional force coming from the retina and lifting the retina up towards the crystalline lens. Always important to do laser first as it shifts your plane of dissection posteriorly and you have a safer entry to go into these eyes. So just a small surgical clip. Once we enter, you can see this uh, tractional forces attaching to the back of the crystalline lens. You do not need to do a lensectomy in a majority of these cases. You can get away with it. You go and do a, some vitrectomy around the port site and then directly go for this tractional force. And just uh, trying to avoid touching the crystalline lens, dissect it out. And that actually does your job for the surgery. You can debulk a little bit of the vitreous around the proliferation and then just do a fluid area exchange and leave the eye like that. So this is post-operative. You can see 20 days post-op, the retina has gone back. You can see the optic disc now and the laser all around and it gets further better from here. So a lot of these cases we have the problem because the traction is primarily temporal. So when you are trying to enter, your two ports are going to be temporal. So there are a lot of chances that you are going to hit the crystalline lens. So what we described here is an all nasal technique. We talk about temporal phaco emulsification. What we do is a nasal vitrectomy. We sit on this eye opposite to the eye being operated and operate so from over So you need to other. conclude, sir. Yeah. So I'm just going to show this one video over here for all nasal vitrectomy. 
So we are operate, operating the right eye and we are sitting on the left side of the patient under general anesthesia. So you can see this fibrous tissue all behind the crystalline lens. So retinal break is something we want to avoid and but along with we also want to avoid creating aphakia because that was an important uh, marker for amblyopia in these children. So this is the central infusion cannula that we have put in. Because our hands are not going to cross during surgery, so this does not interfere with the surgery. And then the two uh, active ports are made on either side of this infusion cannula. Once we go in again, you can see this retina lifting very interiorly in the temporal half. Had we gone in from that side, we would have probably hit this ret lifted retina. And then you can just go about doing your surgery, use some translone. And here you can see this dis dissection between the ridge and the periphery in the temporal half. You can reach that completely from your nasal side and then just go about and dissect it. Yes, there is going to be some bleeding because this ridge is vascularly active. So you have to be careful about that. And once you create this uh, cleavage plane over there, you can see this separation. And then just close the eye. And this is just about one week post-op. You can see the shift of the fovea from where it was pulled and where it has come back. And even this vessels that have come back. So I'll just conclude over here. I'll not go in further detail. This is our surgery for stage four ROP. Stage five also we do and does have some benefit. You give some retinal reattachment and some visual acuity, maybe perception of light and that changes the social behavior of the child. We have an anatomical success rate about of 70 to 90% in stage four and about 20 to 40% in stage five. We have to be aware of the complications, especially a retinal break, because once you have a retinal break, that means the end of surgery for majority of these cases. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, sir, for beautifully bringing out the surgical steps of ROP. And with that, I call upon the uh, third speaker for today. That's uh, Dr. Manab Jyoti Barwan. So he is going to deliver his lecture on retinal imaging, past, present, and future. And since we are running uh, behind time, so if there are any questions, we'll take it at the end of the session. Thank you once again. So um, this is just a repetition of my previous talk. So um, this talk was actually uh, designed for the residents and fellows, but I hardly see any students here. So I, I'm going to speak on retinal imaging, past, present, and future. So, so this is a, uh, one of the most uh, 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 original retinal imaging photograph that was uh, documented by uh, Purkinje on his own eyes using antarctic phenomenon of, with blue lights. So this is probably the first documented retinal imaging picture. So retinal imaging, what is it? It's a two, it is documentation of a 2D image of the th three-dimensional retinal tissue. And initially, the retinal imaging was based, uh, film-based, but uh, with the uh, uh, late 20th century and early late uh, early part of the 21st century, the advancement of the digital technology, the, uh, we have seen lots of new uh, uh, retinal imaging devices. So retinal imaging is basically fundus camera imaging, scanning laser ophthalmoscopy, angiography, and uh, octa, uh, OCT and octa-based imaging. So certain terminologies like the wide field and ultra-wide field uh, we often use in retinal imaging the, um, the, uh, to define a mid, uh, up to mid-periphery, uh, up to six, uh, 60 degree of the field, we uh, term as a wide field and uh, up to 200 degree it is as uh, ultra-wide field imaging. So certain commercially available white field imaging devices are uh, as listed below. The, out of these, the red cam and the optos are the most popular and optos is uh, giving the highest uh, uh, amount of field that is up to 200 degree and it's a non-contact device. So these are two for, uh, comparative photographs. This is the first one is a montage photograph that was used uh, previously in most uh, 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 the centers that uh, comprises multiple fundus pictures and uh, it gives a field up to maximum up to 80 degree of the posterior po uh, retina. And this, uh, this is second is the optos field that, it can, that can cover up to 200 degree of the retinal uh, surface. So out of fluorescence, this is uh, popularly used, particularly for aviatic conditions. It is very helpful uh, to detect. Uh, 
Another uh, autofluorescence bed uh, imaging is a fluorescence lifetime ophthalmoscopy that is evolving in the recent past. It is a non-invasive imaging technique based on fundus autofluorescence. It measures the lifetimes of the retinal uh, fluorophores and it might be used for early, uh, early detection of, uh, and follow-up of subtle retinal changes. So it, uh, it uses uh, up to 200 to 1,000 picosecond uh, uh, fluorophore, fluorophore life, uh, lifetime times, and uh, uh, that is, uh, this shows the highest of the, uh, this uh, lifetime, whereas the phobia shows the least. Then next is the multicolor imaging. It captures images using the uh, simultaneous re reflectance of blue, green, and infrared waves, uh, lasers. Blue gives the inner, um, better view of the inner retina and the vitreous, whereas the green is the uh, uh, deeper retina and the infrared gives the uh, outer retina and the choroid. It provides clearer and more defined images, especially with media opacity and with through a small pupil. So FFA ICG, these are time-tested methods of imaging, uh, still um, popular. These are just comparative photographs of FFA and OCT. You can see the right is a FFA photograph where you can see the fluorescence and the left photograph you can see a nice small polyp in the same location that gives uh, more details of the relation. So these are some of the differences. So coming to the optical coherence tomography, it has revolutionized the understanding and management of retinal structural anomaly. User, these are user-friendly, quick, and non-invasive devices. These are high resolution in vivo imaging, and use, they are useful in follow-up, and um, these are uh, highly reproducible. So uh, in, um, the different generation of OCT are the time domain, as, uh, spectral domain, and SSOCT, the swept source. Then the spectral domain are more popular in uh, current scenario, whereas the swept source OCT is also evolving for deeper penetration. So coming to the uh, OCT biomarkers, these are distribution of uh, the, the two types of biomarkers we have, distribution of fluid on, and uh, on the basis of the structural changes. So these are some of the OCT biomarkers, like interretinal fluids, RP detachment, hyperreflective dots, and subretinal fluid, RP detachment, like the, um, these are some in internal tubules, the hyperreflective dots and the double layer sign. So these are again the hyperreflective uh, uh, tubules. So, uh, subretinal and hyperreflective material, then subretinal, uh, subcoroidal cleft, and this is uh, a yes, uh, subretinal fluid with a double layer sign. So the, this is a large RP detachment with subretinal fluid, and these are interface anomalies uh, showing the vitreous opacities. So coming to octa, it is able to detect early type 1 CNB uh, that is difficult to identify using conventional fluorescent angiography and as the OCT. These are character, uh, they characterize type 2 CNB as a hyperflow vascular lesion in outer retina with characteristic shape surrounded by dark halo. Type 3 CNB appears as small tuft of bright, high flow, tiny vessels with feeder vessels located in outer retina and they help to observe morphologic changes of CNB uh, even after treatment. These are Characteristic patterns discuss, described with um, OCT angiography of the CNBM, that is C-fan, medusa head, ill-defined, and uh, filamentous. So uh, the, uh, on the basis of octa, we can differentiate the active lessons and question lessons also. Active lessons are usually fan separate or medusa type, tiny branching vessels, and asymptotic loops, peripheral arcades, and peri uh, uh, perilational hypointense halos, whereas the question lessons usually present as long filamentous linear vessels, large mature vessels, or de dead tree aspect. So these are uh, just uh, for comparison of a fluorescent angiographic picture of the CNBM, the OCT uh, picture of a CNBM, and the OCT angiographic picture of a CNBM. So this is a OCT angiograph of a um, CNBM before treatment and after treatment. This is again a picture of a uh, OCT angiographic picture, and the above, this is a uh, <coughs> pattern of the CNBM, active CNBM with a RP detachment in OCT, and that is after treatment, you can see a uh, mesure-like vessels uh, with a uh, resolving CNBM. So this is a case, you can see this is um, uh, ARMD cases after multiple inter intravitreal injections, patient uh, came with a RP rip with some hemorrhages in the right eye, left eye uh, with a large P RP detachment, so patient underwent the uh, OCT angiography. You can see large, uh, this is just after uh, multiple intravitreal uh, in, anti-VGF injection. Patient had a large PED with uh, stable uh, retina vision, but suddenly patient developed a REAP with his, uh, on OCT angiography. You can see a CNBM, and then a uh, patient was treated again with anti-VGF, and the uh, 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 retina was flattened, as well as the RP detachment. The other eye also showed a ill-defined uh, halo of uh, um, uh, fluorescence in the uh, below the RP detachment, and this was also treated with anti bgf and you can see the flattening of the uh, uh, retina and the RP detachment. So there is, we should do a real-time angiogram to detect all the lesions, uh, just to miss any other uh, peripheral lesions in the posterior pole. So uh, coming to the future of retinal imaging, these are um, 
uh, certain portable cost-effective fundus imaging devices are uh, evolving, uh, particularly the home OCT is one of the most important uh, OCT imaging devices uh, coming up. Then functional imaging, then adaptive optics to rule out um, uh, the higher order aberrations, and lo lower, uh, uh, longer wavelength OCT imaging, um, that is mo mo based on the spectros, uh, uh, swept source uh, OCT angiography, and uh, the application of the artificial intelligence in uh, uh, imaging. So, uh, uh, coming to conclusion, enhanced understanding of the retinal and macular disease uh, in a more clearly and defined way. This is the, uh, that we can achieve uh, using the uh, different imaging devices. They, uh, this uh, continued development on and focus on improved resolution, faster speed and non-invasiveness, uh, uh, providing details of the structure, function and relationship of the retina is the primary goal of this, uh, all these imaging devices. And the uh, role of the clinician, clinician is to choose the right procedure uh, and to correlate with clinically. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Indeed, it was a very detailed yet precise uh, talk over the retinal imaging technique. I would request the panel to share their experience about the octa in the field of uh, when it comes to diagnose and treat the CNVM. Octa has made our job much more easier and reproducible because over the years we have been relying on OCT and FFA alone, but a real time progress follow-up, Okta is much more helpful in managing these cases. After every injection, you check the vascularity of the lesion with the Okta and it becomes much more easier and a good tool to manage the diseases. So sir, is it possible that we don't go for a FFA and directly go for a Okta and then on that we treat the patient and follow up the patient? Yes, that's how the uh, spectrum is moving. Maybe today we take OCT, FFA and Okta because our experience with Okta is very much limited. But down the line, uh, we might come across a situation when all macular diseases will be managed only with OCT and Okta and not FFA. Thank you, sir. With Thank you that, yeah. So with that, we move to the next speaker. Uh, Dr. Gopal Arora, is he around? No. And sir, then Dr. Thomas, sir. So, uh, so now Dr. Thomas is going to deliver his talk about diabetic retinopathy screening in association with the government opportunities and challenges. I think it's a time-awaited topic to be covered upon uh, because uh, with the current lifestyle, definitely the incidence of uh, this DR has been increasing day by day. So I'm sure that after this talk, everybody is going to be enlightened. Good evening. In the next few minutes, let me take, through, take you all through a diabetic retinopathy screening program which we at Little Flower Hospital Angamali undertook along with the government and the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Trust through the Public Health Foundation of India. I have no financial interest. In fact, this is a tripartite product uh, project between the Public Health Foundation of India, the Government of Kerala, and Little Flower Hospital Angamali, which was implemented in Trishur district. A little bit of background about Little Flower Hospital Angamali. This is the largest and the oldest non-governmental organization working in the field of eye care in Kerala. And we have been instrumental in having so many of the community ophthalmology programs in the state over the last 50 years. Public Health Foundation of India came in in the form of the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Trust Fund, which was um, the aim of the trust was to establish a diabetic retinopathy screening program across India and 10 districts were selected across India and one of these districts happened to be Trishu district of Kerala and we utilized the government services, the government facilities and for that we had uh, to take the government of Kerala into confidence for this. Why we did this project? Because the global prevalence of type 2 diabetes is 422 million the incidence is rising in the low and middle income countries, including India. And Kerala, it happens to be the diabetic capital of India. The diabetes mellitus prevention, uh, prevalence nationwide is 
Um, diabetes mellitus prevalence in Kerala is 17% against a national average of 8%. That means Kerala is very rightly called the diabetic capital of Kerala. Uh, the prevalence is 11 to 19% in males and 15 to 22% in females. And what we see in our hospitals is just the tip of the iceberg. Of these, the two districts of, when we compare all these districts, the two districts of Trivandrum and Ernakulam have one of the highest prevalence rates of diabetes when compared with the others, other districts in India. The Kerala paradox is that rural Kerala has a higher prevalence than urban Kerala, while the national data shows the figures are double in the urban areas than in rural areas. In Kerala, of course, as all of you have seen and read, the literacy rate is very high, but the health literacy rate is not so good. And the high prevalence of diabetes mellitus is also attributed to poor detection rates. When we come to diabetic retinopathy, the global data is about 30% of those with diabetes have diabetic retinopathy. In the Indian studies, it's almost like 7.3 to 26.2% of uh, diabetics have diabetic retinopathy. We didn't have a population-based study from Kerala in this decade, and there's a positive literature regarding the prevalence and patterns of diabetic retinopathy. This provides us with quite a few opportunities. There are, uh, we have the effective screening tools. We take fundus photographs with a handheld non-midriatic fundus camera and transfer the images through teleophthalmology. We integrate all these images. Kerala has a strong public health care system at the primary level, that is a government health care system, and each of these have a non-communicable disease clinic. So this non-communicable disease clinic functions on specified days of a week, and it is through these NCD clinics that uh, we do the screening. There is an effective communication at the network of, of grassroots level workers, that is ASHA workers, Anganwadi workers, and village health workers. And the strategy was to explore the potential for active screening and early detection of diabetic retinopathy in Kerala by making use of existing public health networks for access to the grassroots level. Here I introduce something called a five photograph concept of patient education. Uh, we have five photographs when we uh, talk to a patient. For each eye, the first photo, I'll go to that in the subsequent picture. The first photograph is of a normal eye these four photographs are permanently there. First photograph is of a normal eye. Second slot, we insert the patient's fundus photo. Third is of a diabetic macular edema. Fourth is of a proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And fifth is for a vitreous hemorrhage. The message which we would like to control, uh, convey is your eye should look like that in the first photograph. And right now, it is looking like that in the second photograph. If you don't take care of your eyes, if you don't go through a screening and treatment prog program, it will be like the third photograph of DME or the fourth one of PDR or the fifth one of vitreous hemorrhage. That means blindness. That is a message which we convey to the patient. Which we have the similar set of photograph for the right eye and the left eye as well. So act fast and save your sight. That is the message conveyed at, uh, through these photographs. We analyze the effect of integration of the existing non-communicable disease clinics in the government hospitals for early detection and treatment of diabetic retinopathy using teleophthalmology. And as I said, this was a population-based screening in Trishur district of Central Kerala. The healthcare workers at the primary health center, the Taluk headquarters hospital, and the general hospital were trained on diabetic retinopathy by the base hospital team. Uh, the entire ophthalmology team was trained, that is starting from the optometrist, the counselor, to the doctor, to the ophthalmologist. An optometrist and counselor visits the NCD clinic of these hospitals initially hand-in-hand uh, -hand with the optometrist of the, um, of, the base, uh, of the government hospital. Visual acuity testing was done. Fundus photographs of all diabetics using non midriatic fundus camera was taken. And these, most of these were screened and shown to the uh, patient by the optometrist themselves. And those without a retinopathy were just given a health education and sent off from there, while those pictures which had to be transferred were transferred to the base hospital and reviewed by the ophthalmologist in the base hospital. Diabetic retinopathy versus no diabetic retinopathy was identified by the optometrist on the field. Doubtful images are verified by an ophthalmologist, 
and as part of quality control, random checks were done that is 20% by a fellow in retina department and 5% by a consultant in the retina department. Those requiring further evaluation was referred to the higher facilities in the government sector or the base hospital. That means the government sector was slowly becoming strengthened by, by the training imparted at the base hospital to the optometrist and the ophthalmologist of the government hospital. So gradually we started sending these patients to the government hospital and which could not be managed at the government hospital to the base hospital or the mentor hospital. As part of the statistical analysis, uh, we saw an analysis compared the gender age in the follow-ups, the association between diabetes mellitus and the severity of diabetic retinopathy uh, or PDR and the results were this was the mean age, the male to female ratio was 44 to 55 and th this was the demographic characters. Prevalence of diabetic retinopathy, what we screened in the NCD clinics was 11,298 patients and 1,116 diabetic retinopathy was detected there. That was almost 10% of the diabetic. <coughs> <coughs> Out of which 727 or 80% were NPDR and 187 or 20% was PDR. When this was the blockwise distribution, And again, the association between duration of diabetes mellitus and chance of having a PDR, a patient with more than 10 years duration of diabetes has 2.76 times chance of having a PDR than that with less than 10 years duration of diabetes. Then the association between the follow-up status and the development of PDR, a patient with regular follow-up for diabetic mellitus at the NCD clinic has 0.3 times chance of having PDR than those with an irregular follow-up. Prevalence of diabetic retinopathy among diabetes patients attending NCD clinics of Kerala is almost 10%. The duration of diabetes and chance of having PDR has a significant association. There is a significant association between irregular follow-up at NCD clinics and the chance of having a PDR. And there are a few missing links in service delivery. The age and gender are not significant, while factors associated with the follow-up status of diabetes at the NCD clinics are significant. High rates of PDR and NPDR at detection is a cause of grave concern and diabetic retinopathy was a condition which was getting less attention in the NCD clinics of Kerala. <coughs> to conclude, newly detected diabetic retinopathy among diabetic patients screened through NCD clinics is high. 80% had severe form of retinopathy at detection. Even after attending NCD clinics, diabetic retinopathy including PDR is largely undetected. Longer the, the duration of diabetes, significant is association with PDR. Patients with regular follow-up at NCD clinics have lesser chance of having PDR, implying better glycemic control. So the suggestions are need an integration with ophthalmologists at NCD clinics. An awareness has to be created among health workers for increased early detection of diabetic retinopathy. And the government sector has been equipped for, at least in the pilot district, the government sector has been equipped with the equipments, the study was conducted, the screening was conducted and at the end of the project the whole, the entire equipments have been transferred to the government sector. The government doctors have been trained to do FFA, OCT, injections and laser. Training of all cadres, that is the paramedics have been done along with this. The challenges, ophthalmologists, the stability is in question because as once you train an ophthalmologist and he or she is capable of managing the diabetic retinopathy as part of the government transfer program immediately he or she is shifted to another hospital. That is one challenge which we face. Optometrists and ASHA workers have been trained to pick up these diseases and as part of a recommendation from our part, diabetic retinopathy screening has to be made obligatory in the NCD clinics. That means any patient reporting with diabetes to the non-communicable disease clinic has to have a diabetic retinopathy screening unless otherwise his uh, NCD chart will not be completed and the patient has to be called back for a diabetic retinopathy review. We expect to see a significant improvement in the detection rates with an increased awareness and increased public demand and at the end of this we expect that a democracy can never turn a Nelson side to a genuine public demand that is from the patient side a request and a demand for screening their eyes for diabetic retinopathy. Thank you.
excellently presented and an excellent work, sir. Thank you very much and congratulations for such a nice work in a nice way. So I've got a couple of questions, sir. Um, so please be seated, sir. Uh, so what we, uh, like since our childhood, we have been taught that Kerala has got 100% literacy rate. Then on contrary to that, you said uh, that they are not aware about the health conditions. So any particular reason for that? It's not that they are not aware, they do, just don't care. And many systems of alternative medicines thrive in Kerala. People, um, it's a very sad fact that many of our people, they still have less confidence in going for treatment unless they are affected. Unless they are symptomatic, they don't go for treatment, many of them. In spite of giving all the health education, um, the reluctance on the part of the patient because they believe that they know everything. They don't turn up for treatment. And so you said that your ASHA workers and those workers, uh, the government deputed uh, people, they go, so they go door to door to create the awareness. Yes, these ASHA workers, they move around in the society. They have a lot of other work to pick up. Along with that, they also pick up diabetic patients and bring them over to the NCD clinic. So just based on the history or do they do a random sampling there as well? Based on the so only if the patient knows that he or she is a diabetic, uh, the ASHA worker can pick up and tell the patient to come to the center for screening. Yes. And so, and like uh, you showed in your pie chart also that there was like how many patients they do turn up from the villages to the tertiary centers for their further evaluation and like what is that uh, dropout percentage? Here I would like to bring another point. Uh, from the community to the NCD clinic, almost all of them turn up. From the NCD clinic to the base hospital, there was about a 33% dropout. So that is, that's a huge yeah, And amount. then we followed up these patients and tried to bring them over to the base hospital for further evaluation and treatment. So uh, with that, uh, we just conclude the session. Just again, a call out for two speakers who are not there. Dr. Gopal Arora, if he's around and Dr. Santan Gopal, sir. So with that, we conclude the session. And thank you to the panel, and thank you to the audience. Uh, the speakers who are around. Though we got the hall late. Though we got the hall late. <laughs> Please come over for a photograph, Dr. Manam Jodi Berman.